What's up, guys? Thank you for coming on and listening. Welcome to the show. First of all, I just want to thank XFL Newsroom for allowing me to be a part of their network. It's going to be a really fun time creating content with them and the other podcasts on this network. They've got a great website as well. You should go check it out at xflnewsroom.com. Their Twitter's at xflnewsroom. Make sure you go follow them. Make sure you go check in with them and follow whatever they're doing. They're a great resource once again. Now let's get into this episode a little bit. We're two days away from Guardians football. I'm super excited. I cannot wait to watch the game. In this episode, though, it's going to be a fun one. I got a great interview with Rod Gomez, the host of the XFL Fantasy Central podcast. He's a great resource when it comes to fantasy, and we have a great conversation concerning that. Then I'm going to go ahead and get into potential starting lineups for Sunday and who I think is going to end up playing the most in that game. And then I'm going to go right into potential game day results, what I think is going to happen, and it's going to be really fun to look into that as well. And then... I just want to close this episode out with saying I'm sorry I didn't get any player interviews for this episode. I've been working really hard trying to get player access. I've been in contact with the head of comms. I'm just waiting on a little bit of more information to get through. So hopefully we can get that relationship working. Hopefully I can get those player interviews out with you. I'm super excited. This is going to be really fun though. And I cannot wait for you guys to hear my conversation with Rod Gomez. He's a great resource. And then also I can't wait for you guys to hear the rest of the content in this episode. All right, guys. Cue the intro. This is your host, Zachary Garden, and this is The Guard Post. What's up, everybody? I'd like to welcome to a show a guy who understands fantasy a lot better than me, the host of the XFL Fantasy Central show, the Indoor Cats podcast covering the Oakland Panthers of the, I believe it is NAL, the National Arena League. And then the wood indoor co- football league, indoor football league, the IFL. Pardon me, the Wood Cookie Sawcast, where he covers the um, Canadian, Re- uh, not the Ottawa Red Blacks, so the Canadian Football League, and the formerly the Alliance Football Podcast, where R.I.P. to the Alliance, Rod Vil Gomez. How you doing, man? I am doing wonderful, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. So. First question, we're going to get right into it. What made you decide to podcast about the XFL despite any hesitation you might have had due to what happened with the AAF? Oh, you know, and you're right, because I did I did not want to jump into the XFL waters because everybody was doing it. And with the Alliance, you know, even a month or two out before the season started, nobody was covering the league. There was a lot of teams popping up, but not, not nobody was really covering the league. So that's where I decided to get in uh, because I knew nobody was there. So it was, it was good for me to do it. But once the AAF folded, there was already, I mean, I don't know, at least a handful of XFL podcasts that were already out there oh, yeah. that have been doing shows for like two years now that mm-hmm. before this, the league even had any team. So I knew that I had nothing more to add really to that. And so mm-hmm. I just waited and waited. And then once I heard that fantasy was going to be a thing, um, I knew that it was time for me to, uh, to jump in and actually do a podcast because no one was doing fantasy football. So that's why I got in. And again, like you said, it gets my better judgment in the AAF. Uh, I- I'm all in now. Yeah, kind of same story for me. I was looking at it, I was like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I was definitely hesitant because I had wanted to start a podcast, but I didn't really want to do an NFL podcast because there's already so many really good ones of those. And I'd be kind of trying to swim in a really big pond for my first podcast. So I was a little iffy on that, but then I saw the, I remember the XFL and I was like, Oh, maybe. But then I was like, I don't want it to fold on me like the AAF did last year. So I had to wait a little bit. Then I saw there was a team, the guardians loved their uniforms, loved everything that they were doing. Had a couple of my favorite players from the fleet on the team. So I was like, okay, maybe I can jump in here and be a team podcast. And so far it's gone really good. We're just, now we're just praying and hoping it doesn't fold like the AAF did. Yeah, and and I don't think it's going to fold at least at least after eight games. I don't I don't see yeah. this folding after eight games. I may after a season they may reevaluate, but yeah, not not eight games. At least we're good for a full season. Exactly. At least I can get a full season of content out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that'll be good because like like you said with the AAF, you know, we we were rolling, we were rolling, and then all of a sudden the rug just got pulled out from oh, underneath. Yeah. Us. It was rough. It was rough. So now we're going to go ahead and get into fantasy a little bit. Are there any former AAF standouts that you think are going to make a lot of noise fantasy-wise this season? 
Well, you know, I, I, for a little while, I thought Philip Nelson was going to be that guy at quarterback. I was really thinking that he was going to uh, get the nod. And now, I don't know. We Again, without depth charts, we really have no clue um, what's going to happen. So I was really looking forward to seeing him play. Uh, but we do know that Brandon Silvers is going to be oh, yeah. starting uh, for Seattle. So that definitely, I think, is, is a AAF guy that we barely got to know uh, really because of the whole Mettenberger Hackenberg thing okay. in Memphis. And then Johnny, uh, and then Johnny Manziel. Yeah. <laughs> exactly at the end, throwing his monkey in the, in the, the fight. So, um, yeah, I think Brandon Silvers is going to be a good quarterback. I think the XFL is going to see real quick that he's, he is quality and uh, he can stand up to some of these bigger names that people are throwing around, like the Cordero Jones and the Josh Johnson. Um, but the receiver that I think that's going to make the, the biggest impact is Rashad Ross. Um, we saw him in the AAF with the hot shots just light it up, and he was always good. I mean, there was – I don't think there was a game, and I went through a stat, I don't think there was a game where he was horrible. So, you know, in a, in a league where, uh, you know, it was just – it was hard to, to get started because they were only training camp for like a week or so. Mm-hmm. Um, Ross really looked like he was already in midseason form, and I think that's what he's going to do here. I think he's going to take um, – and, and and really produce for the uh, XFL like he did for the AAM. Oh, yeah. I can totally see that. Going back to Brandon Silvers, he's a guy I really liked when I was covering the um, AAF. I remember doing my QB charting, and he always popped up as a really accurate quarterback. Even on deep balls, he really maneuvered the pocket really well and handled a really bad offensive line that Memphis had. They were not very good on the front, on that front five, and they gave up a lot of pressure, but um, Brandon Silvers did a really good job of handling that, and you could see that during his time with Memphis, and he does handle pressure very well. He's really clutch in the one game he actually got a lot of playing time in before they folded. So, like you said, I expect him to play really well for the Dragons. I remember I listened to your um, most recent podcast, and I think Jonathan Ferguson brought up a couple really good points about him, though, about usage and some of the other things that might hinder him. But from just a pure play perspective that I kind of like to look at, I think he's still going to be really good. Yeah, I do too. And and again, it, we won't know until they actually all take the field because we won't know chemistry, quarterback chemistry, and it, all that stuff. And may, it may even take a couple of games before we start to see actual, you know, gameplay. But I think, uh, you know, if you're looking at it from a sheer coming in, he played last spring. You know, some of these guys that are playing in the XFL right now, it's been a while since they played an actual live snap. And so he's got the advantage of at least going through a training camp last year, playing in some games last year, and you know, and still conditioning off of that. So um, again, I, I think he's a really good add. I think if you're drafting next week, like I suggest, um, he's probably one of those guys where you probably don't have to wait till next week to know that he's playing oh. uh, a ton. So. Oh yeah, and heck, you'd probably pull him out in probably the second or third round, just because a lot of guys are going to pass on a quarterback like him to either pick Cardell Jones or um, Landry in like the first round. And then they won't draft a quarterback in the second round because they're drafting like running backs and wide receivers and stuff. Yeah. And you know, I, I've, I've cautioned people. I know everybody's like, well, you have to take a quarterback right away. And look, I get it. I know that the scarcity is there, but here's the thing. I mean, we see that, especially in the AAF, we saw uh, that the quarterbacks that everybody anointed as the the chosen ones ended up not sticking around very long. I don't know that we had, but maybe one starting quarterback that started the season that finished the season. And I almost have a feeling that this is the way it's going to be in the XFL because oh, yeah. there's not a lot of time, 10 games, you're going to get trigger happy. You're going to, mm-hmm. you're going to want to change things. So quarterbacks are the first thing to go. So if, if a quarterback is struggling, you know, because look at these guys are all talented. Yes. Yeah. But they are all questionable. You know, we've seen, mm-hmm. they haven't made it to the NFL because there's, there's some chinks in their armor. So it's going to show up there too. And, and, and we just have to be patient with it. So take somebody, you know, that's going to play the whole time, like a receiver or a running back mm-hmm. and, and then maybe wait at least a round or two for a quarterback, because who knows that quarterback may not even be there by week three. And you just wasted a very high draft pick on that quarterback. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, when you look at that quarterback, you got to pick guys that you know are basically cemented in. You can't pick a guy like Jordan Tiamu, who barely who won his QB battle recently, or a guy like P.J. Walker, who's reported to win his QB battle kind of here. So those guys are kind of volatile because if they play bad at all, they're going to get pulled. And if you're not doing team QBs, that's not good at all. So And then in the late rounds, draft a backup. 
draft a backup like yeah, Taylor Heineke sure. or Connor Cook. So you can have them just in case those guys get pulled. Now you have two starting quarterbacks that you can either trade for or see if you can get some assets in return. Yeah, and, and again, I'm I'm leaning, I don't know, I, I've been struggling with whether or not I want to do team quarterback or not because I know that it uh, it makes it a little easier when it comes to drafting because then you can you can draft that quarterback position last. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to necessarily uh, do it first. But um, I've I've also seen a couple of interesting uh, takes, and I think I might do this too. Is where uh, it, instead of having a quarterback position, it's a super flex position, oh, yeah. and then and then go down and then have the rest of everybody running back, wide receiver, tight end, um, or maybe not even tight end, just super flex the rest of the way down. So yeah. I don't know. I have today off. I'm experimenting with a ton of stuff that I want to do for the <laughs> listener league. So, yeah, it's it's crazy. And this gonna be fun. I'm. It's definitely volatile out there in the fantasy world because we just don't know what to expect. It's gonna be really interesting to see how it develops. And one thing about developing is, what do you think is going to be the most important position in the XFL fantasy wise? I know we talked a lot about quarterbacks, but in the NFL, the most fantasy, the most important fit position fantasy wise is running backs. We can't deny that they get the most points on average because they're involved in the most parts of the game. Who do you think that's going to be in the XFL? What position? I'm going to agree with you on running back. And and I say that because uh, if you're playing in a PPR league, uh, you're right. I mean, a lot of these, these early plays, a lot of this early, especially early in the season, it's going to be running because – passing routes and, and chemistry between uh, wide receiver and, and quarterback. It, it's, it's, you know, it takes a couple of games to, to fit in. Uh, but these running backs are going to be getting this right out of, out of the jump. I mean, and, and I know that a lot of these coaches, uh, and I know that the XFL says, well, we want to be a, a passing league. But if you look at, at where the sport has gone, right, it used to be a ground and pound running league, the NFL, used to be that, you know, and, and we used to watch running backs all over the place. And then all of a sudden they said, well, we're going to be a passing league. And so now the passing is, but I, I feel like over the last four or five years, the the shift has gone back to a good solid running game because it, you see what is going on now in the NFL with the top two teams having decent running games, right? The teams that are in the Super Bowl now. So I, I know that uh, in a PPR, if you have a pass catching running back, um, he's very good for, you know, double digit fantasy points every time. And I, I think a good running back, especially if you pick the right one and, and he plays a whole season long, uh, could win you the championship because you're right. They have the most touches, you know, 15, 20 carries Re- receivers don't have 15, 20 catches. Nope. They may have five, you know, for a hundred yards and a touchdown, but you know, you give a, a good running back 15 touches, they'll rip off you know, hundred and plus yards and maybe even two touchdowns, yep. you know, especially in short, short, uh, goal to go situations. So, and then of course these extra points, we're going to see how these play out too, because who, you know, you get three points and, and is that going to be a running play from the 10? Is that going to be, you know, a swing pass from the 10? Who knows? Oh yeah. So that's, there's a lot of strategy there too. Absolutely. Is there any running backs you see kind of standing out as they're going to for sure be the lead back in the situation? And they'll be kind of a shoe in for getting at least 10 to 15 fantasy points a game. Well, you know, Donnell Pumphrey is, is that guy that everybody is really on, you know, for DC and, and me too, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that Jarrell Presley is going oh. to, to get more carries by the end of the, at least by the end of the season. And, and maybe even more yards because we watched Presley, right? We did yeah. in the AAF. Yeah, we know what he's capable of. He was in that same Arizona hotshot offense as Rashad Ross. Oh, yeah. And that guy is amazing, right? I mean, he led the league in the AAF by the end of it. And and he's just a good runner. He's a good, solid runner. And, and every week we watched him play, you knew that he could play at some other level you know, be at the AAF or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a feeling that this, this running back battle that we're going to see between Pumphrey and Presley, um, <laughs> two piece, uh, is going to be, you know, one to watch in this league. And it'll be fun. I think it'll be fun to watch these two go at it and try to steal carries from each other. So now that we've talked about the um, XFL kind of as a whole, let's go ahead and narrow it down to the Guardians a little bit for the Guardians fans to listen to my podcast, which is hopefully most of them. Who do you think stands out from a fantasy fantasy? Uh, I can't talk right now. Fantasy perspective on the Guardians, and who does who's kind of a sleeper for you? Well, I mean, I think all eyes we know are going to be on Big Play McKay, uh, right? Mikael McKay, who the receiver that we saw in San Antonio just 
absolutely light up the league, light up the AAF. And, and this is all recency bias too. I mean, I know a lot of people are, you know, say, well, all you did was pick AAF guys. Well, of course, because a lot of these guys, like I said earlier, played last spring, you know, some of these guys haven't played a snap in a couple of seasons. And so they're a little rusty. They're going to try to get back into game speed, but the, the folks that played in the AAF have the advantage of at least eight more games, live reps, uh, in their in their repertoire. So when a guy like Mikael McKay comes in to an offense, uh, it's not going to take him quite as long um, as a, I don't know, Colby Pearson, uh, T.O. Redding, yeah. uh, all these guys. You know, they're, it's just not going to happen. So um, I think he's obviously the guy, and I think he's going to be the number one receiver. But right behind him is Joe Horn, right? Another yeah. guy we know, too. Um, and, and he may come in and, and do good things. Um for them and, and again you know this is all just dependent on whether or not and i think we all know that matt mcloin is probably going to be named the starter right yeah. that's, he's, that's, he's been yeah. the starter since day one there really hasn't been a question about that yeah even with Luis perez coming in it uh, just yeah. doesn't Luis perez is our third quarterback marquise williams is a second yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> and marquise williams isn't that bad either we no, watched him not. do great things yeah i'm a huge for fan of marquise williams actually so i think he's a great yeah. backup i think once Matt McGloin's probably gone, I think Marquise Williams should probably step into that starting role after the season if there's multiple seasons. I think he's got a lot of talent from an arm perspective. He's a guy you should look out for next year in fantasy if there is a next year in fantasy. <laughs> and we all hope there is. We all hope. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, as far as sleepers are concerned, uh, look at that running back position. I mean, it, this this running back position is is not as uh, it doesn't have that standout name like most of the teams uh, do, but uh, but it does have a lot of guys that are good. I mean, and and we see it even in Tim Cook and Justin Stockton, who were teammates of Jarrell yeah. Presley in Arizona, right? So yeah, they were. We know that that Arizona offense was absolutely fantastic, and Tim Cook and Justin Stockton, they actually contributed when they were put in the game. So uh, I think either one of those guys, whichever one uh, uh, takes the, the role, because um, I think they're probably poised more to, to be the starters, one of the two. Yeah. Um, but again, you never know. I think whichever one of those emerges as, as the lead back, uh, which I might, I might lean more toward Tim Cook uh, than Justin yeah. Stockton, but um, that would be your sleeper, I think, that running back position out of, out of uh, New York. Oh yeah, it's definitely at least these first couple of weeks is going to probably be, uh, probably be by committee, which is going to be really interesting to watch and really tough for fantasy fans that pick any of these Guardians running backs. But if I were to say one guy you should keep an eye out for is probably a lot of you know he's been really hyped up in camp and stuff, but T.O. Redding, just due to the fact that he's going to be a red zone threat. He's got the size, the the um the jump ball ability. He's a really good deep threat. And Matt McGloin seems to really like throwing the ball to him, which is a huge thing, especially for a veteran guy like Matt McGloin, who tends to be known for like being a little bit safer and going through his reads and making decisions. If he likes a guy, he's going to throw to that guy. And if he likes Teal Redding, Teal Redding is going to get quite a few targets. So I think you should look out for him. And if you're not picking a quarterback in that first round, I think Matt McGloin's also kind of a safe bet. This is me kind of spitballing fantasy wise, just because he's, going to be the starter for the whole season whether he plays bad plays good i don't think kevin gilbride's going to switch him out he stuck with eli manning for all those years even during his not so great years where he threw a lot of interceptions i could see him sticking with matt mcgloin just in that similar way and then yeah what we look at that running back position i personally prefer justin stockton i like the way he runs a little bit more than tim cook i've always been a fan of the speedy one cut explosive play guy at running back because I think that's what you're looking for on run plays but that's just purely from a scheme perspective in my point I can definitely see Tim Cook getting the majority of the carries basically because he's a lot like Brandon Jacobs who Kevin Gilbride has worked with in the past yeah you need that plotter right you need that yeah. guy that'll get you three yards at least you know and then you know from there you can run other play action uh, plays and maybe swing Justin Stockton out on the third down yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, you're right with these with these running backs. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in who in who you can put in. I mean, we didn't even talk about Darius Victor or, or Matthew Colburn. So, oh yeah, I know. Uh, I'm they may even Matthew jump into Colburn the mix too. Matthew Colburn's a really talented back. I just think he's in a really crowded backfield, so I don't see him. I see him probably as our third back with um, Darius Victor as kind of the goal line guy. So that's kind of how I see that pulling out. So I'd watch out for Darius Victor. He's probably he might steal a couple touchdowns from your lead back. 
Oh, that's so frustrating. Vultures are frustrating. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else we should look for fantasy wise? And we can talk a little bit about anybody else we kind of like really quick. Um, you know, we covered all the big names. Uh, as far as your tight end, look, this is what a question I want to ask you okay. uh, because uh, we have it really. And, and maybe I'll ask you more on when you're on my show, which we'll do that uh, next week. But as far as tight ends are concerned, you have all of them. Uh, some teams have none. You have all of them. Yeah, which yeah. one of these guys is even going to make uh, uh, any sort of noise on this team? We even have one on IR, which is crazy to me. We have five total guys on the roster for tight end. I know I know Kevin Gilbert has talked about at least a little bit that he wants to be a little bit more of a downhill physical team, and I'm guessing that's why I think he wants to – he quoted this about the weather, saying the weather is kind of a factor in how he's deciding to build this team, and he wants to be kind of a physical team. I think that's why he kept four running backs and five tight ends. Five tight ends is absurd to me. I'm guessing we're probably going to cut one or two, one or two of them once the – once one of the guys gets off IR, the tight end, and then we also get either Tanner Gentry or um, D'Angelo Yancey back, which both of those guys, D'Angelo Yancey and Tanner, Tanner Gentry, are tentatively expected to be back maybe week one just because they were on short-term IR. But when you look at that um, tight end position, it's really confusing. I've heard a lot of good things about Jake Powell coming out. I'd expect him to make um, some noise. Maybe Jake Sutherland as well, the two Jakes. I mean, really, there's just each guy does something a little bit different, which is really interesting. EJ Bibbs is more of a pass catching, can work out of the slot kind of guy. Um, Jake Powell is kind of a mix of both. Jake Sutherland is more of a blocking guy that can run routes and be successful in the passing game, but he's more of a blocking guy. And then for the life of me, I cannot remember the other guy's name right now. I feel really bad. I should know this, but it's just Keenan really, Brown can he'll forgive Keenan you. Brown, Keenan yeah. Brown will forgive you. Keenan Brown, um, he's also more of a receiving guy. So we got two really kind of more receiving guys and then two more blocking guys. It's really interesting, but I've heard a lot of good things about Jake Powell coming out of camp. So that's a guy I'd expect to probably slot in as that starter, but I'd expect a lot of two tight end sets, and I wouldn't expect a lot of receiving production out of these tight ends. I kind of feel like that's the going to be the case league-wide. I don't see these tight ends because a lot of these, these names don't lend themselves to, uh, to pass catchers, which is why, again, uh, and I know that everybody's complaining about the DraftKings format right now, but you honestly can't go with a regular classic format mm-hmm. When you have tight end, the tight end position, that's not necessarily one that I want to draft. I don't want to draft kickers. I don't want to draft team defense. So this super flex position, this this showdown slate, it, it works exactly the way it's oh. supposed to work right now. So, yeah. Uh, um, really, everybody would just be picking um, Truesdale because he's probably the most talented receiving re- receiving tight end out there and the one that's probably going to get the most um, love from the quarterback. I believe he plays for the Vipers right now with um, Aaron Murray. So he's probably going to be the most utilized one. If you really do want to pick a tight end, I'd probably suggest him. Or I remember you guys, um, you talked about with the, um, I forget who you talked about it with, but about Purim from, I believe, the Renegades. He's a guy that could get a lot of usage as well. So those are two guys I'd probably pick. But other than that, I don't see anybody else in the league that's really going to be used. Yep. That's, I mean, that's exactly it. And so now everybody, you're either one or the other at 50%, you know, or 75, 20 or whatever. So oh, yeah. it just, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to it. The position doesn't lend itself to it. No. So really quick, any advice to any of the guardians fans listening, or even to myself about daily fantasy, how do you think we should build our rosters? What do you think our captain should be and everything like that? So I, oh my gosh, I've been, I've been messing around with, with different combinations. And, uh, you know, I said on my, on my recent episode that, uh, or no, actually I said it in the, uh, in the Periscope video that I, uh, put out earlier, uh, that when the AFL, uh, the arena football league brought draft Kings into the fold last season for the first season, they did the same thing. They did the showdown captain mode. Um, and so something that you can try to do is stack a couple of different quarterbacks and their receivers or players on that team. Um, there's room, especially with the, the pricing uh, for some of the mid range quarterbacks to, to do that kind of thing. So if you, you know, pick maybe the, the game that's supposed to have the highest um, uh, point output, right? Take a look at, uh, at who's projected to have the, the highest over under uh, total 
and go from there, right? Take take the number one receiver, pair it with the quarterback, and maybe the running back, uh, or or the first and second receivers if they're actually priced correctly, um, and do that and stack that game. Uh, or you can, you know, just try to get a little piece of everything and, and try to make it interesting and watch all the games. Um, but I highly suggest that what you do is is you just take a look again at that highest point total, right, and go from there. Um, and, and, and find yourself a good wide receiver quarterback stack and maybe do it three times. <laughs> maybe pick three yeah. quarterbacks and three receivers. It, there's, the options are limitless. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're going to close it out real quick. I have one last question for you. What are you most excited for this season? I'm just most excited to watch more football. And just like I was last season with the AAF when they said they were going to continue – uh, I'm just most excited that once the Super Bowl is over and my 49ers are victorious, that on Saturday I can sit down and continue to watch more football right up until the Canadian football uh, season starts, and then I can continue to watch more football then. I never have to stop watching football, and that to me, my friend, is the best thing in the world. Oh, I bet. I need to get into the Canadian Football League. Actually, I want to get on that no more, no football life as well. That sounds fantastic. All right. Where can they find you? Where can all, all these people that are listening right now find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at RJ Gomez, and you can find my show, XFL Fantasy Central, on Twitter at XFL Fantasy Cast, and, of course, uh, on Instagram at XFL Fantasy Cast as well. Not too really uh, active on, on Instagram. I'm going to get better at it, but, uh, yeah, Twitter is where I live basically so it's at xfl fantasy cast same here twitter is where it's at when it comes to sports podcasting personally i want to thank you once absolutely again. i want to thank you once again for coming on the show it's been a pleasure having you and you know what sorry i think the chiefs are going to win the super bowl just ah, that's okay you're still going to come on my show and we'll still talk but oh yeah ah. <laughs> all righty man thank you for coming on absolutely thanks for having me absolutely What's up, guys? We're back from the break. That was a great interview with Rod Via Gomez. He's a great resource. I just want to thank him once again for coming on, and we had a great talk about fantasy football. But now we're going to go ahead and move to on-the-field stuff. We're going to talk about a projected starting lineup, and we're going to go ahead and start with the offense on our most obvious position on this entire team, the quarterback position. It's going to be Matt McGloin. We can just go out and say it. There's really no doubt about it. I don't even think the team's officially announced it, but we know Matt McGloin is going to be the starter. He's been the face of the franchise basically as we move forward, and it's going to be a lot of fun watching him play. I'm super excited to see him and his veteran experience lead this team onto the field on Sunday. But that's who I expect to start quarterback. I don't really think there's any mix-ups. Uh, Marquise Williams is the number two guy. He's really talented. I wouldn't be surprised if we throw him in every once in a while. There was a report from Geoff Magliochetti who was at the practice on Wednesday talking about he was in punt protection as well. You could see some trick plays there. And then Luis Perez rounds that out as number three. He's more of an emergency quarterback. I'm not a huge fan of his game. I used to be in the AAF. I love that he was really good in the spread system, but in a more pro-style system, I don't think he's very effective. So uh, he's our number three quarterback. And then we're just going to move a little bit, stay in that same backfield and move to the running backs where Tim Cook looks like he's going to be starting Geoff Magliochetti. Really great resource, by the way. You can go and follow him at G E O F F Mags M A G S five four nine zero on Twitter. He's a great resource. Covers a lot of New York sports, and he does cover the New York Guardians as well. So, if you want to get a little bit more information on that, make sure you go ahead and follow him. He's really, really great to listen to when it comes to New York sports and the New York Guardians as well. But he reported that it looked like Tim Cook and Darius Victor were getting a lot of work in the ones. I'd expect probably Tim Cook and Justin Stockton get a lot of those one reps, though. I really like Justin Stockton games, like I, Justin Stockton's game, like I've said before. So that's who I expect. But it looks like Tim Cook is going to be our workhorse per Geoff Magliochetti. So I, that's something to watch develop is how that running back position develops. I do expect the carries to be a little bit split, but Tim Cook to be the main guy, considering it looks like we're going to be running more of a power 
run type offense with a lot of deep play action passes intermixed in between. Now we're going to go ahead and move to the other skill position, the wide receivers, and we'll start at outside wide receiver. It gets a little convoluted there. We've had quite a bit of injuries with D'Angelo Yancey and Tanner Gentry, both hurt on short-term IR. It's going to be really interesting to see how that develops that position as a whole. But I do know that Mikhail McKay is our number one. He would be our number two probably with D'Angelo Yancey if he was healthy. But since he's not, he's our number one guy with Tail Redding as the other outside receiver. And then Colby Pearson will probably end up working in the slot. I know the coaches really like Colby Pearson. He's the guy I expect to really contribute from the slot position, whether it's on deep passes or shorter ones as well. But Tail Redding is a guy I'm also really excited about to play that number three outside receiver and trot out there in those three receiver sets. I think he's really talented. He's got really long strides. He's got great long speed, and he's really good and adept at getting the ball in contested catch situations. So he's a guy to look out for to kind of explode onto the season scene as the season progresses. But keep an eye out for Austin Duke as well in four receiver sets. That's who I expect them to trot out in four receiver sets. You could also see Justice Liggins as well due to his fact that he's able to play outside receiver and inside. But I'd expect him to probably switch in and out with Mamichael yeah, with Mikhail McKay and Teo Redding at that out, outside receiver spot. That seems to be where he thrived the most during camp. So that's what I'd expect to see from the receiver position in three receiver sets. It's most likely going to be Teo Redding, Mikhail McKay, and Colby Pearson to start the game. Now we'll go ahead and move to tight end where Geoff Malyoshetti also reported that trotting out with what looked to be the ones was EJ Bibbs. I know in the interview I said Jake Powell might get the start, but EJ Bibbs wouldn't surprise me either. He's a little bit more of a pass catching threat while Jake Powell can be more of a blocker. And I expect them to interchange mostly, but that for that first series, it's probably going to be EJ Bibbs walking out to start that game. And honestly, there's going to be a lot of rotation in these positions they're really getting a feel for these they don't they had a pretty short training camp not a lot of time with these players so we there's really no determined starter but this is who i expect to be the starter. i expect ej bibbs to get the most reps on sunday now we're going to go ahead and move to our offensive line we're going to start at left tackle jaron jones he's really talented and really long he's got great size and athleticism but he doesn't really have the name the experience pardon me the experience to play the position very well he's a switch over from a defensive tackle to a left tackle and it's really been an experiment in the nfl when he was there but with his size and athleticism i expect him to thrive at that left tackle spot and considering he was our number one pick in the offensive lineman draft i'd expect him to end up with the start right tackle i expect it to be john kling from buffalo he spent time at the aaf with atlanta and he was really good there before he suffered an injury i expect him to move to right tackle he was a left tackle in the aaf but I expect him to be right tackle with Jaron Jones at that left tackle spot. It's going to be really interesting to see him develop and be really good as that right tackle spot. I really like his ability and his technique. The center, I expect to be Ian Silverman. There was an interview with Kevin Gilbride earlier this season that when Ian Silverman came back, communication along the offensive line really improved, so I'd expect him to probably end up being the starter there just due to these some small reports from the team and from Kevin Gilbride himself. Offensive guard Damian Mama is probably going to be the starter offensive guard along with either Anthony Coyle or Avery Young. I could be very wrong here. I'm not super familiar with offensive line play or what the scheme is going to look like, but I think Damian Mama really fits in well with this what we think is going to be a power running scheme, and I think he'd play really well at that position. And then Anthony Coyle or Avery Young both have stints in the NFL, both are pretty talented. Avery Young's a really good guy out of Auburn. I cannot remember the college Anthony Coy went to, but I know he spent some time in the NFL. So those are names to watch out for. But I expect Damian Mambo to be the starter along with one of those two at the other offensive guard position. And that's what I expect our offense to look like. We're probably going to be more of a power run, play action pass scheme, which I really like. I'd hope we'd spread it out a little more. I'm not a huge fan of two tight end sets in this today's football environment. But... If we do run that, I'd expect to be very talented. I mean, we brought four tight ends. We have four running backs. They're all very talented running backs. So just keep an eye out for that power run scheme with a lot of deep play action passes coming off of it. I'm going to go ahead and run through this projected starting lineup one more time. So quarterback, Matt McGloin. Running back, Tim Cook with a splash of what I expect to be Justin Stockton. Outside receivers are going to be Tail Redding and Mikhail McKay with Justice Liggins rotating in. But Tail Redding and Mikhail McKay are going to get those first snaps. 
our slot receiver, our third receiver is going to be Colby Pearson with our fourth receiver and four receiver sets is probably going to be Austin Duke. Tight end is probably going to be EJ Bibbs per Geoff Mavio Shetty. And then Jake Powell, I, ex- I expect to rotate in. Left tackle is going to be Jaron Jones, most likely. Right tackle is John Kling. Center is going to be Ian Silberman. And the offensive guard is going to be Damian Mama with either Anthony Coyle or Avery Young starting. We could see some rotation along there as well. So don't be surprised if that happens. And now we're going to go ahead and move to my favorite side of the ball, the defense. This is where it gets a little confusing. We don't know what we're going to run on defense. It's going to be a lot more multiple in that case. But I expect us to start out in a base 3-4. That seems to be what our personnel in my eyes is built for. We could run a 4-3 or a 3-3-5 as well. And I'll get into those, but I'm going to start by listing off our starting defense in a 3-4, and then I'll go over the differences that would happen in my eyes if it was a 4-3 or a 3-3-5. We'll go and start with our defensive tackle, our nose tackle, or our zero-tech guy, the guy that lines up over the center in a shade of the center, is probably going to be Joey Mbu or TJ Barnes. They're both very talented nose tackles that can fill up a lot of space. You can see Joey Mbu move out to a four-tech, which I'll explain in a second, but TJ Barnes... Really big guy, so is a Toby Johnson, a guy that will rotate in there. But it's probably going to be Joey Mbu or TJ Barn at that zero tech. Now we'll move a little bit outside to the four tech defensive tackle, the guy that lines up over or to the outside of the guard and between the guard and the tackle. I expect Kayvon Walker to make the start here. I think he's very talented. I think he's got a really good hand speed and a lot of quickness at that position. I like his ability to be able to be a pass rusher from that position. I think he ends up lining up there. You can see Joey Mbu work out there, too. He's a little bit quicker. He might be a little bit too slow, big to work out there. I expect him to pick a little bit speedier guys to work there because they are more. They can be more of a pass rusher from that four-tech spot. And we'll move a little bit farther outside to the five- or six-tech defensive end, which is a guy that lines up head up or outside the tackle. I expect that to be Gerald Owens or Bumney Rotimi. That's who I kind of expect to line up there. They're both more of an edge rushing type. They're both really strong. Gerald Owens is very much more of a run defending guy, while Bumney Rotimi can rush the passer a little bit. So I expect that to be very situational, where if we're in a third and one, fourth and one, but Gerald Owens might be in, while we're in a third and 10 or a third and 15, I expect Bumney Rotimi to be in most likely. So that's what you could see at that five or six tech defensive end spot. When you look at the outside linebackers in a 3-4, they're going to be more pass rushing types. So I expect Charles Wright and Ryan Moyer to get the start there. Ryan Moyer brings a lot of experience and a lot of versatility. He can drop back in coverage a little bit. So that's who I'd expect to be starting there. And he brings a lot of hustle as well. A good tone setter for a defense. So that's a guy I expect there. And then Charles Wright is more of your pure pass rushing, a lot of talents kind of guy. He's had some injury struggles in the past, but he shows he's shown a lot of bend and a lot of first step quickness, which I really like. And he's a guy I expect to kind of end up starting at that outside rusher and primarily rush the passer. But that's who I expect our outside linebackers to be, Charles Wright and Ryan Moyer. We're going to move to the inside linebackers now. There's going to be two of them. And this, I really went for a combo of guys that complement each other. Ben Heaney is probably the lock here. He's shown a lot of leadership through camp. He's kind of been the face of our defense throughout camp other than Jamar Summers, who I'll get to in a minute. But he's been kind of the guy that's always on their social media. And he's just a really talented downhill kind of backer. So I expect him to end up getting the start, and he'll probably have that captain's patch on if they have them going into the first game. And the guy, I see comboed with him based off of one of Ben Heaney's weakness, which is coverage, which is coverage, is Jawan Johnson. Really talented cover type linebacker. He played a lot of safety in college. He's really rotated in at a strong safety type role in a 4-2-5 defense of Gary Patterson when he transferred to TCU. So I expect him to fill that role of a coverage type linebacker that can cover tight end and a little bit of slot guys in this defense. So I think he's a really good complement to Ben Heaney because Ben Heaney's not the best cover guy in the world and I think Jawan Johnson brings a great combination of skills that can complement Ben Heaney's game of course this could be Ben Heaney and anybody you could see Frank Ginda slid in there you could see Nick DeLuca but I do expect Jawan Johnson just because of his ability to cover as well now we're going to move to my favorite positions my favorite position group the defensive backs we're going to start at outside cornerbacks I fully expect Jamar Summers to be the one the number one corner matched up against usually their best receiver in this case, it's probably going to be Centavius Jones or um, 
Reese Horn, one of those two. I expect him to be locked up on him most of the game. Jamar Summers is a real lockdown guy at this level, and he's really talented, so that's who I expect to be there. And I expect our other cornerback to be Rant Tejada. I know he's a little bit undersized to some, but I really like his ability to cover. I know Mike Mitchell is very high on him as well. But I think he brings the ability to stay on an island and really man up and play a little bit of zone as well in a defense that needs another outside cornerback to step up. Now we're going to go to the slot corner and kind of our diamond nickel package guy who I expect to be Terrence Alexander. Terrence Alexander has lined up all over the field throughout camp according to reports. He's, coaches love him. Coaches love his ability to think through coverages and be really smart and multiple. So I expect him to be able to line up in that slot corner position where he can drop back in coverage or he can blitz or he can do a, really anything. So that's what I expect there. He's going to be our nickel and dime package guy as well. You could see him even line up at outside corner in place of Rantha de Tejada because I know the coaches really like him. But I expect him to be a really multiple slot cornerback nickel package kind of guy. We're going to move a little bit deeper now to our strong safety, which I think is going to be Demetrius Cox. He's really a popular pick and a really popular player amongst analysts and fans about who's probably one of the more talented safeties in this group. He's a really good, just multiple kind of guy. He can play deep. He can play up in the box. I think he really thrives in the box, though. So I think that's why he's going to be more of a strong safety type. You could see Drayvon Askew Henry rotate in here. He's also very talented in the box safety. But I fully expect Demetrius Cox to be making the start. And when we move back a little bit deeper to our free safety position, I expect, I expect it to be Wesley Sutton. Wesley Sutton's a really talented safety, really got a lot of range, really good cover guy. So that's who I expect to be really the guy back there in the back of that secondary kind of calling the shots because he has a lot of experience going from sideline to sideline. You could see Demetrius Cox move back here as well. I think Demetrius Cox, like I said, is very talented. You could see AJ Hendy, who Hendy, pardon me, AJ Hendy, who they see as a very talented athlete and cover guy, move back there as well as that free safety. But I do like Wesley Sutton's ability to move around and make plays and have a lot of range in his ball hawking ability. So that's why I expect him that I'm making the start at free safety. So now we're gonna go ahead and get through the differences real quick in a four three. Some of the differences I expect, I'd probably see Jarrell Owens and probably Charles Wright starting at that defensive end position opposite of him. I think Charles Wright's a very talented pass rusher. They're not going to want to keep off of the field. So I think Jarrell Owens and Charles Wright are probably starting at those defensive end spots with Bumley Rotini rotating in. I'd expect probably the two defensive tackles to be Kayvon Walker and Joey Mbu with, um, with TJ Barnes and Toby Johnson rotating in as well so that's what i expect from the defensive line that third linebacker would probably be frank ginder or juan hines it'd probably be a combo of frank ginda ben heaney and juan johnson that's what i'd prefer i think juan hines provides a lot of speed for an outside linebacker spot as well and i think he could play well off of ben heaney and juan johnson so that's what i expect the differences to be in a 4-3 the defensive backs would probably stay the same but in a 3-3-5 the defensive line would probably stay the same we'd probably have some combination of Joey Mbu, Kayvon Walker, and Gerald Owens or Bum Nirotimi. And then you'd probably have outside linebackers. The extra one would be either Charles Wright or Frank Ginda. This really is based off of how you want to run your 3-3-5. I know in my college playing days, we ran our 3-3-5. It was very multiple in what they want to do. They'd like to have linebackers rush along with the three other rushers so you get a four-man rush most of the time. So if, that, if that's the case, you can see Charles Wright lining up at linebacker. But if not, if they want to run more three traditional 3-3-5 three, three, where our three linebackers are more roving in coverage and stuff, Frank Gendel will be that guy because he's able to play downhill but also play in coverage a little bit, whereas Charles Wrights may not be experienced in that phase of the game. And then that fifth defensive back would be some combo of probably Terrence Alexander and maybe Jawan Johnson rolling in there. I don't know if that's the case, then you'll see Charles Wright and Frank Ginda at those outside linebacker spots. But the reason I say Juwan Johnson is because he played some safety back in his day. And if we're playing against a really run heavy team or a two tight end heavy team, like say what we think the Seattle Dragons are going to be, you can see Juwan Johnson in there to really affect the run from a safety position. But if we're going against a team like the Houston Roughnecks, where they go a lot of four, maybe even five wide, you could end up seeing Terrence Alexander getting a lot more reps because he's better suited to deal with that type of offense. So 3-3-5 gives him the opportunity to be very multiple, and that's why it's one of my favorite defenses. But 
I kind of expect us to probably run that 3-4. And I'll go through those starters one more time in just a second. I just want to hit on one more thing with the 3-3-5 is that it's not really successful in the pro game. It doesn't allow you to really deal with the run very well. But in a pass-heavy league like this is looking to be against teams like the Defenders and the Houston Roughnecks and maybe even the Dallas Renegades, I'd expect them to maybe bring out this 3-3-5 or a dime or nickel package i can never remember which is which i believe it is the nickel package because you have five defensive backs so i'd expect that to be out there a lot more against teams like that whereas against the seattle dragons we'll probably see more of a traditional three four kind of look because we want five guys on that line of scrimmage so i'll go through those three four starters one more time d tech the defensive tackle or the zero tech is going to be Joey Mbu most likely. The four tech defensive tackle is going to be Kayvon Walker. I believe the five or six tech defensive end, I believe is going to be Bumney or Timi mostly, but Jarrell Owens will definitely rotate in there. That could be a 50-50 split on snaps. Outside linebackers, the two starters I expect there to be Charles Wright and Ryan Moyer. Inside linebackers are going to be Ben Heaney and I hope Jawan Johnson because he, I think his skills really complement Ben Heaney's a lot. The outside cornerbacks are probably going to be Jamar Summers and Ranth Tejado with maybe Terrence Alexander getting reps there as well. The nickel and dime package guy or that slot corner will be Terrence Alexander because he's very multiple in what he does. The strong safety, I could be see Demetrius Cox because he's a very talented, very multiple guy. And the free safety, I could see Wesley Sutton as well starting. So that's what I think our starting teams are going to look like. This is all kind of based off of speculation and how I see the team fitting together based on talent. I wasn't there at the training camp, so some of these guys could have played better than others. For example, Ranthi Tejada is probably my least lock here just based off of some play, some guys like his style, some guys don't. So it really matters how the team viewed him. But he's on the team, so I'm assuming he played well enough in camp to be viable for a starting position. That's why I'm picking him here. And also that safety position. There's a lot of guys with similar skill sets. Wesley Sutton's really the only one that stands out with a different skill set, so that's who I expect him to end up starting because I feel like he was brought here for a specific purpose. But that safety position could be played in a lot of multiple different ways, so that's the one thing that I can see changing there. And that, that running back position as well is one that's going to be very multiple, and we're going to see a lot of guys getting carries. I think we have a, a bunch of talented backs Matthew Colburn can carry a workload. Justin Stockton can carry a workload. So can Tim Cook and Darius Victor. They're all very talented backs that bring a lot of different things to the table. So I expect them all to get in the game, and I expect them all to play. I personally want to see a lot of Justin Stockton. I really like his ability to play the game. So just keep a lookout for that running back position. It's going to be interesting to see who gets the most carries and most usage. And yeah. After this break, which we're about to go into, I'm going to go ahead and talk about what I think needs to happen on game day for us to win and what I think is going to happen on game day. We'll see you after the break. All right, guys, now that we've talked about what we think the projected starting lineups are going to look like, we're going to go ahead and get into what I think is going to happen this Sunday and what, what the Guardians need to do to win this game on Sunday against the Tampa Bay Vipers. So I think eventually we'll win by seven. This can change. We haven't seen either team really play. It's going to be really interesting to see this develop. But I think we win by seven. I think we have a big day from the Guardians run game. I think it really stars up in... New York in that little bit colder weather, a little less acclimated to a really vibrant passing attack at this point in time. This is going to be a day of reckoning for this offensive line. The Vipers don't have a talented pass rush, but this offensive line has been kind of a talking point throughout. There have some, been some people that doubt this offensive line, and rightfully so. There's not a lot of proven names on this offensive line. I mean, Jaron Jones, who looks to be our starting left tackle, is a former defensive tackle in college who's been transitioning. He's got a lot of size and a lot of talent, but there hasn't been really that the body of work to prove that he's going to be a good left tackle. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this, let this um, offensive line really plays together throughout camp. I think Matt McGloin cannot throw two interceptions or more like he did in the preseason game, and we win. The other, team's gonna, the other team is going to really capitalize on those opportunities if he throws those interceptions. So I think he needs to keep the ball out of the defensive hand, defense's hands. And I think Matt McGoin really needs to make sure he's throwing touchdowns and not interceptions. We still need to keep getting those big plays, though. I understood during 
the preseason game, he was taking a lot of chances. And I think that's just how the offense was designed for that preseason game to see how people performed under pressure and trying to get big plays. But we still need those big plays. We can't go uber conservative in this game because it looked like our offense really thrived when we were getting big plays. I believe four of the touchdowns we threw against the Vipers in that preseason game were over 50 yards or at least 30 yards. I mean, three 30-plus yard touchdowns is really huge for a team and it really shows a weakness that could be there in that Viper secondary. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that develops. I think our wide receivers will be able to play well against them. Tio Redding had a really good day. Colby Pearson had a really good day, and so did Justice Liggins during that preseason game. So it's going to be interesting to see how those develop. But we still need to make sure we get big plays, either if, even if it's out of the running game with Justin Stockton ripping off big runs or Tim Cooks really rattling th- through defenders and making big plays. So we just need to make sure we get a lot of big plays. And I know these are very kind of basic. A lot of teams still will say, we need to get big plays, but that's just how I'm going to do this without really seeing any film from any of these teams. And then now we're going to move on to the defense real quick. The defensive line may struggle a little bit. I'm not super high on our defensive line and our ability to get rush the passer. And with Aaron Murray, it's important to make sure he's uncomfortable. When he was at Georgia, when he played really well, it's when he was comfortable. Same with when he was in Atlanta with the Legends. So I'd expect them to try to get pressure through blitzes and other opportunities, but I don't think our just a four- or three-man rush is really going to get to him because we don't have the talent at those rush positions that we really need to be very prolific pass rushers. But I expect our DBs to play really well. I think, I think we match up really well against this big but not fast Tampa Bay wide receiver core. So I think we'll really shine as a defensive back group. I think they'll really shine there and make a lot of plays, whether it's interceptions or just pass breakups. I don't think they're going to a lot of passing yards doing that, but we need our defensive line to really step up and make a lot of big plays. And we'll see how good they are as a group this weekend. And really, there's not much else I can say. Just because I haven't seen really any film, it's going to be really Once again, it's going to be really interesting to be watching this game and analyzing it and then watching it again afterwards to make sure I don't miss anything because I'm going to really study the film after this week and really try to get any of the tendencies I can from this game, really get any of these stars that I think are really hiding underneath that are getting open a lot and not thrown to or other things, for example. And we'll see. The important thing to realize, though, before we get into this, don't overreact to anything we see from this game. This is the first game of the season. These are small sample sizes, so if we blow them out, Don't overreact saying we're the best team in the league because of one game. If we get blown out, don't overreact saying we're the worst team in the league because it's one game. It's important to realize that, hey, this is the first week. Some teams come in more prepared than others. Some teams come in hot right away, and some teams come in cool and heat up over the course of the season. We're definitely going to see. I know Kevin Gilbride's been really critical of his team throughout camp. I don't know whether it's coach speak or he's being real there. It could be a mixture of both. But we'll just have to wait and see how that develops. Like I said, with everything in this league, we'll just have to wait and see how it develops. It's one of my favorite words. I know, I'm sorry, I repeated a lot, but it's just the truth at this point in time. And yeah, I'm super excited. Two days away, games going to be really fun to watch. Super excited to be kind of leaving a live commentary on Twitter when I'm watching the game. So expect those tweets to come out. Once again, I believe this is going to be the end of the show here because I really don't have anything else coming up. It's a very short episode this week. Sorry, guys. I was trying to get a player interview, but I wasn't able to. Some things fell through. Hopefully, we'll see some of those next week after this game and at with a little bit of dialogue about the game as well. It's been really fun talking to you guys. We're going to go ahead and close out the episode here. Uh, make sure you follow me and the podcast at TGP underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you follow the XFL Newsroom on Twitter at XFL Newsroom. And follow all the other podcasts, link to them. They're all great listens. Make sure you visit their website. I want to thank them again for allowing me to be on their network. And hey, make sure you listen to the episode I released earlier this week. It's going to be a weekly thing we do. Me and Rolf Veenster. You can follow him at Rolf underscore five on Instagram. And not on Instagram. Leave his Instagram alone. Follow him on Twitter at Rolf underscore five. Make sure you... Listen to the episode. We're going to be doing that every week and just giving a little bit of a discussion on what we talk about, what we see throughout the whole XFL. Those will be released on Tuesday. These are going to move to Thursdays, these episodes, and I might do a little bit something Sundays if I have the time. I usually work Sunday nights, so I may not be able to, but after every game, I might see if I can release a little bit of a quick instant reactions to this. It'll be very unedited, very 
kind of, as you will say, laissez-faire, very relaxed when I release those. So I want to thank you guys for listening. Once again, make sure you subscribe to the channel, leave, rate and leave a review. I'd love to hear them. I'll make sure to thank people that do. Make Hopefully it's five stars. If it's not, I'm willing to figure it out and figure out what I'm doing wrong. But anyways, thank you guys for listening. Enjoy the games this weekend. Enjoy the rest of your day.